Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the CAL webinar on orientation assessments, content delivery, and validity. This webinar is a repeat of the webinar we delivered on October 20th. Please note that uh, we will post the PowerPoint and the recording of the webinar on our website shortly after um, the webinar. Um, and we'll send information about uh, what, when the, the PowerPoint and the recording is up on our website as soon as that is available. The format of today's webinar will be a presentation, a brief overview by uh, me, Sanya Bevich, the director of the Core Center at Cal, and then my colleague Julie Sugarman of Cal will conduct the majority of the presentation on RMPCO assessment. We will also have um, a brief uh, bit by our colleague Kara Sheldon from um, the IRC. Uh, she presented on the original webinar. She was not available to present in person today. However, we have a high quality recording of her presentation and we will be uh, playing that for, uh, for you today. Before we go into Julie's presentation, I just wanted to provide uh, a brief background on kind of how we got here with the um, assessment. So um, all of the, the building blocks that Cal has been working on the past few years uh, with the goal of strengthening um, orientation provision to refugees along the CO continuum overseas through um, domestic are really grounded in this idea of the CO continuum and the idea that orientation for refugees starts overseas and then continues domestically through initial RMP orientation and then uh, beyond that. And a big part of this process has been to take um, a big picture look at orientation, at how it was done, what the, the practices and the stated goals and desired outcomes were, and to come up with um, a baseline in all sorts of ways, a baseline for um, the content and um, critical messages that should be conveyed along the continuum, which we did uh, working with the CO work group and, and all of you, uh, both national agency headquarters and local affiliates, through the development of the CO objectives and indicators. There's a set for overseas uh, orientation and domestic orientation, and then continued from there to revising the Welcome to the United States book to reflect those messages and then developing the reception and placement orientation curriculum um, last year um, and um, the RMPCO assessment and the broader umbrella of the assessment toolkit um, that was also developed and, and is on our website. Julie will be saying more about that. Um, and right now, continuing on that trajectory, we are working on a comprehensive training, training of trainers manual for the orientation continuum to be accompanied by a video and that will be released at um, the end of the day at the end of the year. So the, the RMPCO assessment um, was developed as a part of this uh, larger effort um, to um, establish um, a baseline for, um, for refugee orientation and to take a look at um, how uh, the delivery of orientation was working, uh, both overseas um, and domestically. And the assessment was developed in collaboration, as I mentioned, with the CO work group, working closely with, uh, with PRM, of course, and um, uh, based on the needs assessment, the broad needs assessment we, we conducted with input from, um, from many of you and, and certainly national um, agency um, headquarters um, and, and many other stakeholders. So I will turn it over to Julie now to talk um, more about um, the assessment. And before I do that, I just wanted to mention that we will have um, ample time for questions and answers at, um, at the end. And all of you will stay mute throughout the, um, the webinar and we will be um, asking you to please submit your questions in the chat box. We'll be reviewing those questions and we'll answer as many uh, questions as possible during the, the 90 minutes we have available today. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm just going to uh, quickly 
um, close our Outlook so that we uh, don't get interrupted by any messages. Um, I'm really pleased to be uh, talking about the uh, assessment again today. I think this is a really important topic and we got some amazing questions last time so I know that everyone is thinking uh, critically oops, about um, thinking very critically about assessment and how to make it go smoothly. So first I want to mention that what we're going to discuss today is the use of assessment to evaluate CO outcomes, which is to say whether participants in CO understood and retained the information that you provided. We developed a model CO assessment that a lot of agencies have been using, and some agencies are using other assessments or other ways of documenting participant learning. We've been getting copies of modified assessments and completed assessment forms that we are analyzing in order to improve the assessment and to develop additional tools like this webinar to help agencies with their assessment plans. This webinar is based on a number of conversations we've had with agency staff as well as our analysis of how the model CO assessment and other assessments are being implemented. So let's first consider why do we assess. The reason behind everything we do is that we want to ensure all refugees are able to demonstrate basic competencies and be can become self-sufficient. Assessment can help you document the good work you're doing for monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring, of course, has to do with compliance with your agreements with your funders. But more than that, we want to use assessment results to understand what CO delivery methods and messages are effective, what might not be effective, and whether there are certain groups that require different kinds of CO based on their particular circumstances. Assessment results are one piece of information that you can use to improve your CO delivery in terms of how CO is provided and what kinds of instructional strategies might work better to help people understand this challenging content. When someone designs when someone designs an assessment, the most important consideration is what the purpose of the assessment is and how the results will be used. In the case of CO, it's what we just discussed on the previous slide. We want to be sure the participants can demonstrate basic competencies. The features of the model CO assessment that Cal designed and what we would recommend for other assessments that are intended to fill the same purpose are the following. Give it to one person at a time provide maximal opportunities to get questions right, and ensure there is flexibility in implementation within limits of good practice and ensuring consistency within affiliate or agency. These features allow you to ensure that participants have every possible opportunity to demonstrate what they have learned. For CO assessment, we are also dealing with very diverse populations, including some participants who may not be familiar with Western testing practices or question styles. The design features in the model CO assessment relate to, relate to diverse participants and community contexts um, in terms of the use of an oral open-ended interview, which is an easy to understand format for participants who may be unfamiliar with Western testing practices and who have low literacy or education, prompts to ensure understanding, and wording questions in the abstract, so that the focus is on ensuring that they understand and re retained the messages that you gave them during CO, whether or not they believe that that information is relevant to them personally. And we'll go over an example of that a little bit later. In terms of ensuring participants understand the question and really know the answer, this is the key to the way we designed the assessment. We want to be sure that refugees, especially those who are not used to an assessment interview situation, have every possible opportunity to show what they know. They should not get the question wrong simply because they didn't understand it. It's difficult to write an open-ended open question that allows for people to answer based on their personal or community, community circumstances that's neither too vague nor too leading, which is why we wrote the question as clearly as we could and then rely on assessors to understand when to prompt with a different phrasing of the question to get the kind of answer we're looking for. When we say that you should ensure that assessment questions are valid, that means that it's important that the questions you ask yield answers that really get at the underlying concept. Again, because of the diversity of your participants, 
Using prompts and rephrasing, rephrasing confusing concepts helps a question be more valid. So let's look now at some things that the Model CO assessment was not designed to do. First is to show which participants exceed basic competencies and develop high levels of understanding of CO concepts, and similarly to demonstrate that a refugee has received CO on all required CO topics. The model CO assessment that we designed covers the basic concepts, but it doesn't touch on everything you cover in CO. If you want to assess everything, that's better done as formative assessment, where you break up the assessment into pieces and assess content after each unit. We wouldn't be able to design uh, one single test that covers all of the material that you cover and have that, um, that would just take way too much time. So this is really a snapshot of the information that your refugees have. Another purpose that it was not designed for is to indicate which broad CO topics, like education or health, should undergo curricular revision. However, results may point to areas for further investigation, and instructors may want to reconsider how to teach the specific con concept covered in the question. So you can't say that someone doesn't understand health in general based on just one question. But of course, if lots of people are getting that specific question wrong, you might look at how you're teaching that specific concept. Another thing that the assessment was not designed to do is to label individuals as passing or failing, although it may be used to flag individuals who require additional support. Again, it's just not detailed enough to be able to say that someone with a score of 7 or 9 or 11 is OK and below that is not, because we don't really know what that magic number is. So we don't want to use the assessment results as the only piece of information that you would use to label a person as, you know, quote, passing or, quote, failing. But it certainly does give you valuable information about what any individual is able to do in general. And you can use that information to decide on how you're going to follow up, if at all. The last purpose I wanted to mention is that this model CO assessment was not intended to demonstrate the long-term impact of cultural orientation. So, for example, if a person gets all 11 questions right, does that mean they're going to be super successful in the resettlement? We can't say for sure. But a learner assessment is a very important step in thinking about long-term outcomes. Because if you want to find out if CO is effective in the long term, you need to know whether your messages were understood and retained in the short term. And that's what this assessment looks at. So now we want to talk about some potentially problematic modifications to the guidelines for delivering the model CO assessment. These modifications are things that we have seen in uh, assessments that agencies have sent to us that some of the local agencies are using, um, and also based on the, some of the responses that we saw in the pilot when we collected uh, uh, completed assessments. Um, so all of these suggestions are based on some things that we're starting to see happen, as well as some um, things based on best practice in assessment. The guidelines for uh, giving the Model CO assessment are on the assessment toolkit online. Um, we have the guidelines for use of the model RNPCO assessment, which is a short document that goes along with the assessment itself. And then there's a question and answers document, Q&A, about the model CO assessment. And that actually provides a lot of the same information that I'm giving you here in this webinar. So there's a number of documents online uh, on the Cultural Orientation uh, Resource Center website in the assessment toolkit section that can help you um, understand assessment and know how to um, give the model CO assessment. But let's talk about some uh, potentially pro problematic modifications that we've seen. One potentially pro problematic modification is doing the interview over the phone. Phone communication can be challenging, especially if one or both parties are speaking in a non-native language. Another issue with doing it on the phone is that you can't accept written evidence. There are a couple of questions like asking for the participant's address and phone number and asking about interpretation which allow participants to provide written evidence, either using a pre-printed card or pointing to an address and phone number in a cell phone or writing something down. 
Again, this assessment was designed to give people every opportunity to show what they know, and if they get a question wrong because they didn't have an opportunity to answer visually, they haven't had the equal chance at getting the questions right as folks who are given the assessment face to face. However, you might try a video conference like Skype so that you and the participant can see each other, and we'd be interested in hearing how that goes for you if you do try a video conference. Another potentially problematic modification is doing the assessment in a group setting where you have a number of people who are sitting together and each gives an answer to the question that everyone else can hear. This is difficult because later respondents may just parrot earlier answers and just repeat the same thing someone else said. They may also have difficulty thinking of a unique response if you ask them to try to do that, especially if they're the last person in a series of five or six to answer the question. Another issue is that allowing one person to speak for a group does not mean that all individuals have learned CO concepts. One thing that agencies have asked us is, can we just have an entire case take the assessment together, and as long as there's one correct answer for the whole case, then we'll consider that okay. But remember that the concepts in the assessment are critical for everyone to know. So if one person is doing all the talking, we don't know if everybody has really received those messages. A third potentially problematic modification is conducting the interview in English without translation. Again, we really want people to be able to, under, to understand the questions and to provide answers that demonstrate their understanding. So if they're not very fluent in English and they get something wrong, we don't know if they don't understand the concept or they just want to express it in English. Moving on with some uh, additional problematic modifications. The main issue with participants writing their answers is not that it's a bad practice in and of itself, but the questions on the current version of the model CO assessment were not worded with the intention of having them read and answered by participants by themselves, which is something that we've seen uh, and heard happening uh, in some agencies where you've taken, uh, folks have taken the actual model assessment, printed it out, and handed it to someone to fill out. Um, one problem with this is that on a written assess assessment, there's no opportunities to prompt, and the questions that we have included are worded in such a way that they really do need that opportunity to be able to prompt. So we are actually working right now on a written version of the assessment that has slightly different questions that don't require prompts. Um, so we encourage you, if you want to use a written assessment, to think about what makes a written assessment different from an oral interview, but also to um, um, just hold on a little bit while we are uh, finalizing that written assessment example. Another modification that we've seen is that suggestions for when to prompt are removed from the assessment form. If this is the case, assessors may accept or reject answers that should be prompted, like answers that are too vague or when someone says that the concept isn't applicable to them personally. Also, the information in the, in the italicized text under each question is meant to help assessors understand the underlying indicator for a question. For example, for the question, how do you get from your home to the grocery store, I've seen on some of the pilot assessments that we've reviewed that some assessors were accepting the answer, I go by bus. But that's not the underlying concept that we're testing. So in the prompts, it explains that if the person says something like, I walk or I take the bus, you should ask them some additional questions that ensure that you know that they know where it is, how far to go on the bus, or how far to walk. They don't have to give you a lot of detail, but just uh, some evidence that the person actually knows how to get from their home to the grocery store. So uh, it's really important that every assessor using the Model CO assessment at least has access to a version that has that italicized text below each question so that they have the prompts that will help them better understand what kinds of responses we're looking for and what the underlying indicator is that the question was built on. In looking at the assessments that agencies submitted this summer as part of the pilot assessment, we noticed that some agencies removed the space for assessors to write down the answer, and in some cases, it seems that assessors overly, overly summarized the response, so it wasn't really clear how specific the partici participant was in answering the question. 
The reason we left space in the model CO assessment to write down participants' responses is to allow agencies to have a review process to ensure scoring accuracy and consistency. This review process might entail going back over a group of completed assessments to review how different people scored the same question. This review process would also allow agencies to find out what are common errors that should be addressed in CO. These practices will only be possible if the answers are captured on the form in some way. The written answer doesn't have to be completely verbatim, but as long as you're capturing the essence of the answer, that allows you to go back and do some analysis of whether assessors are scoring consistently and what some common wrong answers are. Finally, in some cases, the instructions and reminders to assessors on page one were removed, like what to say before the assessment starts and some reminders about prompts and so on. Even if instructions to assessors in terms of how to give the assessment are given elsewhere, key instructions should be included on every assessment form so that assessors don't forget anything important. So we've talked about some modifications to the overall assessment that's given, and now we're going to look at the wording of some questions as some agencies have added questions or changed some questions. Um, and I want to give you some ideas of some things to look for when you are reviewing new questions or modified questions on your assessments. The first thing that might be a problem is to ask for an opinion, a yes-no response, or a question for which there is truly no wrong answer. For example, do you think that cultural adjustment will be easy? That's a yes-no question. Or what are some things that you enjoy doing in your new community? These types of questions may provide some interesting information, but they don't work very well on an assessment where we're trying to sort out who has learned information and who has not. So these kinds of questions that don't have a right or wrong answer don't really contribute to that purpose. Although if you're just adding a question and the purpose is not to contribute to the assessment itself, but to give you some additional information that you'd like for some other reason, that's fine. But you should just be aware that these types of questions don't really contribute. When we think about you know, what questions are we going to put on a test, we think about how does asking this question and getting an answer help us with the broader purpose, which is to find out whether people know this information in general or not. And these kinds of um, questions generally don't work very well in that regard. Another issue is questions that may not apply to everyone. For example, why should you learn English is an example of a type of question that we've seen on some modified assessments. The Cal wording for this one is, what is one reason why it is, why it is important to learn English? Or another similar acceptable alternative is, why should a refugee learn English? So the problematic phrasing, why should you learn English, asks the person why they themselves should learn English. And so you might get a non-responsive answer like, I already know English, or oh, I'm too old to learn English, I don't need personalizing their response. Well, we're really assessment in those older ladies are very frustrated or may not think that they need to learn English. We want to know, even if they've not yet come around to believing that they personally need to learn English, what we're really assessing here is that they've heard the message that you gave in CO. So that's why it's worded in the abstract. So what is one reason why it's important to learn English, or why should a refugee learn English, are better than asking a really personalized question. Knowing that a person thinks that he or she is too old to learn English is, is very important information for you, and it's something that you'd want to follow up with. But again, thinking about the assessment and the purpose of each of these questions, um, the personal question of, I don't, I don't think I need to learn English, that's not really what we're trying to get at with this question. Another uh, possibly problematic question are self-report questions, such as, do you know how to ride the bus? That's also a yes-no question, which is problematic in ways that we've already discussed. But the other issue with it as a self-report question is that you're just asking, uh, the, these questions have us take the participant's word for it, that they know the content or not. And for this assessment, we want to actually get some evidence that we can write down. For example, the Cal wording is, how do you use, and then you say the name, of the local public transportation system. 
And so the answer to this question is, oh, I buy a ticket and then I get on and I go three stops and then I get off and so on. So having the participant give you a few details provides evidence that demonstrates that that person, at least at that moment, had that information, as opposed to asking, do you know, and they say, oh, yes, or oh, no, and you just sort of have to take their word for it, and you don't have any evidence of whether that's really true or not. Moving on with uh, some additional uh, problematic questions, one could have too much detail, such as, how do you get from your home to the near to your home from the nearest supermarket where you do your shopping to get food for your family? I didn't see any that were really quite this wordy. This is a little bit extreme, but it just gives you an example of using more words than are really necessary. So you want to watch out for that. And on the flip side, too little detail is also a problem. Questions like how can you get help or what programs do you use? provide too many opportunities to avoid the construct of interest, what we're really actually trying to get at. The participant may say something that's correct, but doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with what they learned in CO. For example, with how can you get help? You may be looking for the answer, I call my caseworker. But the participant may say, oh, well, when I'm at home and I need help, I ask my sister to help me wash the dishes or something like that. So these questions don't really have enough detail in them to signal, signal to the participant how they should respond and what level of specificity you're looking for. Another problem is questions that are too big, such as, what are some rights and responsibilities you have when you work with our agency? Or, which laws in the US are unfamiliar to you? These questions, as I've worded them here, are just too overwhelming. In the first case, it's a little bit too open-ended. You want to give the person an indication of how much you're looking for, so it would be better to ask for one right or one responsibility so that the participant knows how much you're asking them to say. And then in the second example, again, it would be better to ask for one, one law or two laws, and it would also be better to make it more specific as to a domain of U.S. law, such as laws related to how you treat your children. If you've ever been in an interview and been asked a very general question like, so tell me about yourself, or so what do you think, what do you think about the future? You know that those questions are a little off-putting. They're a little hard to answer because they're so general. And in this assessment, we want to make questions as clear and easy to answer as possible. The last issue I want to talk about, I haven't seen too many examples of, but in survey research, we always like to look out for double-barreled questions, like how do you pay your rent and utilities? This example isn't too bad because you could consider this two questions for half a point apiece, but I'm sure you've seen examples of questions on surveys that were hard to answer because they asked something like, was such and such entertaining and easy to use? Well, I might not be able to to give just a one-word answer to that because I might think it was entertaining but not e easy to use or the other way around. So it's really important just to ask one question at a time and you can always add multiple questions or ask follow-up questions or prompts if you need um, the person to give you multiple steps or multiple uh, details. So all of the questions, all of the items we've covered here are basically talking about making the questions specific enough that people know what kind of an answer you're looking for. Whether you're using the model CO assessment that Cal designed or something else, there are a number of decisions that local or national agencies should make in order to help assessors know how and when to use the assessment. These instructions are particularly important if you want to be able to compare the results of one case to another or compare across agencies or over time because you need to implement the assessment the same way in order to be able to compare the results. So some of the items that you might need to decide in your agency how you're going to handle them are the following. Who conducts the assessment? How will assessors be trained and monitored? When are participants assessed? Should scores be shared with participants? What, if any, follow-up support is given to participants who demonstrate misunderstandings? Can participants retake the assessment if they score poorly? How are data stored, analyzed, and shared? What additional data are collected to contextualize findings? What additional tools, such as a CO checklist or communication from assessors to case managers, should be used in conjunction with the assessment?
So, um, so all of these are things that you can be putting together in an assessment plan to help your agency make decisions and to implement the assessment consistently. In our previous webinar a couple weeks ago, we heard from Carrie Sheldon of the IRC about some of the systems that they've put in place around conducting CO assessment. We have a recording of what she said in that webinar, which we'll play for you now. So hold on one second while I get that set up. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about how we at the IRC approach um, some of these agency level decisions that you're seeing on the slide now. Um, we decided that all of our offices would use um, the standard um, assessment developed by Cal for all of our adult clients um, arriving after April 1st. And so we do have a number of network-wide protocols. Um, many of the things that Julie just covered, um, things like the oral administration, one person at a time. And so those network-wide protocols, um, I think, um, help us avoid nearly all of the potentially problematic modifications uh, that Julie covered. I think we have one exception where um, we do uh, allow one um, small exceptional circumstance for some phone administration. But otherwise, our network-wide protocols um, keep us sort of on the right side of, of those other issues. Um, but even though we had network-wide protocols, there are a number of things that still needed to be decided at the local office um, level in order to carry um, this out. So the way we approached this was about two and a half months before our offices were going to start using the assessment, we launched our rollout and we launched it with a training. And as part of that, we asked each office to sit down um, and work in small groups, actually, and to begin to develop their own local protocols uh, for their office. So answering some of these questions here. Who was going to conduct um, the assessment in their office? Um, the most frequent way that's done in our offices are CO instructors, um, the client's caseworker, or in some cases a caseworker that does all of the assessments for all of the, the case load. So making a decision within their local office on that item, as well as when the assessments would take place. And again, most frequent for us is at the end of CO class or at the 30-day home visit. And then within that decision, too, sort of cascades a number of other decisions. Sort of if it is a CO class, how are they going to handle um, their protocols for all of the rest of the students uh, waiting their turn uh, for the assessment? Or if they were going to do it in the home, how did they avoid kind of ending up in a group interview um, situation where the whole family is getting the, the um, assessment at the same time? Another key thing we wanted each office to decide a protocol for was how information on the CO re assessment results would get back to the caseworker or the other, other staff in the office that would need to know that, particularly if there's additional um, instruction needed um, that was revealed um, through the assessment. So that was another protocol that we asked each individual office level um, office to decide upon. So while we didn't standardize each of these items at the network level, we did standardize in a sense that every office had to have a local protocol, which would then get to achieve that consistency in administration, um, at least within, within the office. One other thing that we did um, to help with consistency was that we developed an, a number of network-wide training materials and tools, and we were trying to achieve consistency and scoring of the assessments through these tools. Um, so not only that we're, we're scoring practices consistent um, within an office, but th there was a, a decent level of consistency across all of our offices. And some of those tools included a mock assessment, um, some answer guides, and so on. And I don't know yet that we fully achieved um, consistency, um, and so we're going to be looking into that over the, the coming months um, to kind of see what how um, different assessors in different offices are scoring um, a client responses. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was that we do um, require that all of the assessment scores get entered into a database that we have, which allows um, each office to then review its aggregate um, assessment results and identify patterns. Um, maybe not to draw conclusions like Julie warned us against, but to see kind of are there differences in results based on whether the client attended a classroom um, CO or individual CO by the office, 
or are there differences in results based on when CO is completed for a particular client relative to their arrival date? So those types of things are, um, we will begin to start looking at those, um, which is enabled by the fact that we did ask every office to enter the CO uh, assessment results into the database. So I think those are some of the, how we approach these agency level decisions, and I hope there's something in there that might be helpful to some of these other, uh, the other agencies. Okay, so uh, we really appreciate hearing from the IRC a couple weeks ago and um, hope that you found that, that uh, summary useful. Um, so based on their work and talking So, with the other agencies about decide so if you have um, that you have for creating an assessment, not um, audible. So I'm going to just tell you uh, one more time that uh, we really appreciate the IRC sharing their processes and some of the work that they've done to help affiliates. And so based on this, we've decided to create a planning template for thinking through these decisions. Um, this is something that we're working on currently. So you'll have some more help in creating an assessment plan. One thing that we've been hearing about in our discussions with agencies is concerns about specific groups that, have, that are being assessed. Again, agencies should have discussions about how they want to handle these situations. But here are just some suggestions that we have uh, based on these discussions. In terms of highly literate refugees, the model CO assessment was intended to be given to a diverse population of refugees. So some refugees may be surprised or offended that they are being asked basic questions about life in the US. Assessors may want to reassure these participants that the assessment was designed to be used with refugees from diverse backgrounds and that the same questions are asked of everyone, regardless of their level of education or past experiences. Another group we're concerned about are elderly refugees who do not provide answers to specific questions because they don't feel they, don't, they apply to them, or who may have trouble with the entire assessment saying, oh, I don't have to know any of this, my son will take care of me. Our advice is similar to what I said previously. Make sure that the participant understands the concept of an assessment and the purpose of this particular assessment, and then provide specific prompts as suggested. If they still provide non-responsive answers, those should be marked as incorrect. And of course, you should stop the assessment if the participant becomes distressed. Agencies should develop policies for how to follow up with such participants in terms of having them understand the information. Finally, we're aware of the difficulty of assessing refugees who live far from the local resettlement agency. You might consider using Skype for these assessments, training a local partner to give the assessment, or combining the administration of the assessment with another purpose for seeing the participants. And again, agencies, agencies should develop policies for these situations. If you have any additional suggestions about assessing these groups, we'd welcome your comments for us to share in the Q&A portion of the webinar. Finally, I want to come back to the issue of prompts, which we've discussed in general, but this is one of the most unfamiliar pieces of the assessment we designed, so I wanted to talk about it in just a little bit more detail to be sure that the specifics of using prompts on the model CO assessment is clear. Correct, incorrect, and prompt guidelines are general, and they don't include all possible scenarios. In that italicized text that you see below questions on the model CO assessment, we included some possible correct or incorrect responses, but we couldn't possibly think of or include all of the possible right or wrong answers. So assessors need to use their best judgment and have conversations within your agency and with other service providers about the types of correct and incorrect answers that you'll accept. We recommend that partial credit should only be awarded where indicated. Credit should not be awarded for answers that are close 
Although in many cases, there are prompts that can be asked to allow respondents to be more specific or to try again. Again, we're trying to get at whether people know this information or they don't, while being mindful of the fact that we have a lot of participants who are not used to Western assessment or questioning practices, and different people may interpret the question different ways. So even if you think that you've come up with the perfect wording of a question, someone is going to misinterpret it, so you need to be ready for that situation. So overall, prompts are used if the participant misunderstood the question, if their response is too vague, or if the participant indicates the question is not applicable. And I want to uh, go a little into a little bit more detail on this last one um, because we um, uh, have given some examples of this within the Model CO assessment, but n not in every single case where it could possibly happen. So I just wanted to make sure this is clear. Um, one place where the Model CO assessment doesn't provide guidance uh, that says that the participants can be given a prompt if the response is, uh, indicates the question isn't applicable to them. One example is, what is one reason why it is important to learn English? As we've previously discussed, if the person says that he or she already speaks English, they should be given a second chance to answer the question correctly because they've misunderstood the question as it was originally asked. So our overall recommendation is that assessors should be sure they know what the underlying concept is being assessed in each question so that they can really think about whether the answer they're hearing gets at that underlying concept or do they need to ask the question again or in a different way to make sure they're finding out whether that person really understands that underlying concept or not. So we've heard a number of concerns and issues with the Model CO assessment, things that we're working on. Um, some of those things are um, the pictures. Some of them are not clear in terms of what they're trying to show. They're sort of open to interpretation. Uh, we also heard that some pictures of people may not be culturally appropriate because of the amount of skin that's shown. So we're taking a look at those pictures and seeing if we can um, find some different ones or some alternative guidance on that. Um, we also will be providing some more general guidance on prompts, similar to what I just said here, um, that's not necessarily um, included as well as it could be on the assessment itself, um, and some additional guidance on how to prompt without giving away the answer. Um, we also will have some other clarifications based on the pilot results to some questions that there were just some issues with where we could tweak the wording or give some additional guidance on correct, incorrect answers or prompts. Um, as I mentioned, we're also working on a written version of the Model CO assessment for literate refugees and a template for the agency to use to create an assessment plan. So those are some of the things that we'll be working on through the rest of this calendar year that will help you create an implementation plan for your, uh, for your agency. Uh, now I'm going to turn it back over to Sonia, who's going to say a few more words about resources, and then we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Julie. And before I say a few words about resources around assessment and also some other resources we are working on, just want to reiterate kind of the overall uh, message on modifications of the assessment, and that is that a number of different things may work in different contexts and in your local context, context and it is all right to modify the assessment. However, when um, implementing those modifications, someone who understands assessment design, someone who understands monitoring and evaluation overall, whether that's someone at the local level, if there is a person with that um, expertise, someone at your national headquarters, or CAL, somebody should review proposed modifications to the assessment before those are implemented to make sure that the integrity of the assessment is maintained uh, through implementation of um, those modifications. So um, if you do find yourself in that situation uh, at your agency, obviously the first um, 
point of contact is, is your local agency and then from there going to your national headquarters and checking with them to see whether um, there is someone who can uh, conduct that review and give you some feedback and we are working closely with all of the agencies um, at the national level and with PRM um, and to um, take a look at, at anything that may need um, our review. Um, so again, the, the, the general message is of course, there may need to be tweaks uh, to the assessment, um, but those need to be carefully reviewed so that the, the purpose of the assessment is, is maintained through the various versions. Um, before we turn it over to all of you for any questions you may have, just a couple of words on um, resources that are um, not only available on our website, and some of those are um, up here, including Making Your Way, way the Reception and Placement Orientation Curriculum. Uh, Julie has already talked about the Assessment Toolkit, which is also on our web website and includes objectives and indicators the RMPCO assessment and a question and answer document which, which we recently updated based on some initial findings from uh, the assessment, our RMPCO assessment pilot, uh, but also other resources uh, to support your work. Um, one um, set of resources that I also wanted to mention are refugee backgrounders. The one you see up on the screen is the, the one we produced last year on the refugees from the DRC. We are in the very final stages of um, completing the background on refugees from Syria and that will be placed on our website in, um, in the next um, week or so. Um, and in addition to curricula, materials, um, and all of um, all of these, um, there uh, we have also done a lot of work, as um, as many of you know, on uh, videos with refugee testimonials. And there is a videos section on the website with numerous videos, including Faces of Resettlement, which is a brief one on contribution of refugees to their communities, with um, testimonials from. Um, resettled refugees and community members, and then a number of group-specific videos, um, refugees from Burma, refugees from Iraq, uh, Bhutanese refugees, etc., that, that have information and testimonials from those particular groups, um, and also a new day, which is um, uh, one that specifically talks about refugee youth, uh, children and youth, and, and refugee family adjustment to different settings, but schools in, um, in particular. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, the um, current uh, set of resources that we are working on and planning to complete by the end of the year is the training of trainers, culture orientation training of trainers packet, which will consist of a trainer's manual uh, with an accompanying um, video showing uh, different CO settings, both overseas and domestically, and some uh, current practices in effective orientation delivery. As always, we'll communicate about those resources through your um, national um, agencies through our listserv, uh, PRM will, will send a notice, but please do look out for those first, the Syria backgrounder very soon, and then the TOT materials at the end of the year. Um, so now is um, time for um, any questions you may have on the assessment or anything else related to CO. Okay, it sounds like the presentation, and thank you very much, Julie and Carrie, was um, complete, and you do not have any questions at this time. So please look out for the PowerPoint and the webinar recording that we will be um, putting up on our website, www.culturalorientation.net, in the coming days. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>